for the recording to start. And okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for connecting to BC three zero eight, our course on Revelation and Daniel, and uh, we are continuing our journey in the book of Daniel, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, looking at all the uh, the main prophetic texts in this chapter. Let's um, pray together and we will start. Somebody could um, um, lead us in prayer, please. Anyone could pray. Can I pray faster? Please, thank you. Dear God, thank you so much uh, for this class that we're about to learn about the book of Daniel. And Lord, that we may, uh, as we are learning, Lord, that we may understand. And Lord, that you help us to um, see that the things that you have for us, God, and what we need to know, Lord. I pray for Pastor Shish, God, as he's about to teach, Lord, that you pour out your spirit and as he's teaching, Lord, that we may be. Uh, listening and paying attention to what he has to say, God, that we may not just be the person who listens, but be the doers of what he's teaching, and also, Lord, that we may uh, share to those who have not heard about it, God. Thank you, Lord, for everything you need me pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being on the class. So, last week, we um, in the second lecture last week, we read through Daniel chapter 8 and we just began to kind of, you know, look at uh, the key things in that chapter. So today we will um, get into the details. Daniel chapter 8, uh, the plan is to also cover Daniel chapter 9. I think we will be able to do both. Uh, so if you can do both today, that'll be that'll be great. Okay, so just to quickly um, uh, recap a few, you know, where we were. Um, Daniel is recounting another vision, or reporting, or sharing with us another vision that he had. Uh, and in this vision, again, he sees images of animals. Like what he saw in Daniel seven, he saw you know he referred to those as beasts, but here in Daniel eight, he sees a ram with two horns, and then he sees a goat uh, with one with one horn. Again, that's a male goat with one horn. That's also very unusual, right? Uh, a, a male goat um, with just one horn, uh, you know, coming up. Uh, from its uh, front, but anyway, so you have this male, and then he sees things happening. He sees these two animals interacting, and he kind of describes all of that. And then, and so you know, so let's get into the details now. What we have mentioned earlier is um, the interpretation is often found within the chapter itself. It, so. When we said, you know, we asked towards the end of the last class, we asked the question, and okay, so what do these animals mean? And that is already pointed out for us in this chapter. Uh, so uh, I, I hope all of us have Daniel chapter 8 uh, open in front of us. So Angel Gabriel comes near to Daniel and he explains to him, he says in verse 20, verses 20 and 21, he says, Daniel chapter 8. Verses 20 and 21. The ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. Verse 21. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that you saw that is between its eyes is the first king. Right? So the interpretation is given to us right here. So Gabriel tells Daniel, Daniel, the, the ram is representing two kingdoms, Medes and Persians. Now, if you look at verse 3, Daniel chapter 8, verse 3, the ram had two horns, he saw, 
one horn was the second horn the, the horn that came up later was bigger than the first horn and verse 20 says they represent two kingdoms Medes and Persians and sure enough the Persian kingdom was more became more stronger more powerful than the Medes so if you look at historically the sequence of events the Babylonians were replaced by the Medes the Medes were there for a brief period of time and then they were overtaken by the Persians so they are from he said I saw this ram from moving east so they're coming from sorry they're, they're they're from the east moving west north and south right so the eastern part basically representing what we know today as Iran uh, Iran Persia Iran and this kingdom was moving westward that means they were conquering and they were taking over regions west north and south so they were moving westward towards the Mediterranean and so they conquered you know the Babylonians and so on but after them came a goat and then he says what is the goat verse 21 kingdom of Greece so on the other side of the Mediterranean Greece comes this goat and the goat is moving eastward right and this goat had he says in verse 5 I saw a male goat it had a notable horn between its eyes a very big horn and verse 21 says this horn that you saw is the first king so this horn horns usually represent leadership kings leaders and so on so this goat was moving eastward so Alexander the Great who was the first leader he moved east and he began to conquer he began to take over territory and we know historically he came all the way to India you know the northern part of India or north western part of India he reached all the way there from Greece okay so um, Daniel this, uh, Daniel saw that in this vision right if you see in verse 6 onwards he says the ram that had uh, so this goat came to the ram that had two horns and um, it confronted the ram that means the goat ki the kingdom of Greece overpowered the Persians it destroyed uh, it, it cast to the ground verse 8 look at verse 8 then the male goat which is Greece kingdom of Greece grew very great and that is true from all the way from Greece he extended his empire all the way to India that's a huge territory right and says but when he became strong I'm looking at verse 8 the large horn was broken and in its place four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven so um, uh, this this first horn the first uh, this this first king right as he was becoming strong suddenly he was broken and that is so true uh, historically that's what happened Alexander the Great uh, he was a great conqueror he he, he grew very fast but he also died very young and that's what he says in verse 8 he became very great he became strong he was broken and then in place of it I'm looking at verse 8 in place of it four notable ones came up and that's exactly what happened after Alexander the Great suddenly died uh, he had four generals so the four generals basically took over parts of his the Greek Empire his empire right? and we mentioned some of that uh, in the PDF and maybe um, you know the uh, 
PDF will have some uh, a map as well, so it's good to just look at it at this point. Let me uh, go back here. So Daniel 8, right? So he died, and four kingdoms came out of his empire. And broadly speaking, it those regions covered. So of course, in those days, they were not called Turkey in Syria and Egypt, but they covered regions that today we can say predominantly, not exclusively, predominantly Greece, Turkey, Syria, Egypt are part of those uh, empires. Now, uh, the, the I'm showing you this picture. This is not the Greek Empire, but it's the Roman Empire. But think of it. He was here, right, somewhere here. And he expanded, uh, Alexander the Great expanded his kingdom all the way across. And he comes all the way through, uh, you know, towards northern part of India. That's that'll be somewhere here. Right? He comes all the way through. He comes, and he takes over. Now, after he died, um, parts of his so this part somebody took over. So which would cover major portions of uh, Eastern Europe, and then Turkey. Another person, another emperor took over. This part, another person took over, which basically is Syria and that part. And here, this part, Northern Africa, another person took over. So broadly speaking, right, uh, these were the four major divisions of um, his empire that, that were taken over by his generals. Now, this map that you're seeing is that of the Roman Empire, Roman empire which came later. But I'm just showing, just trying to point out the regions of the Greek Empire and how it was taken over. Right. So, what is amazing is that um, um, Daniel saw this while he was in. Uh, in the reign of King Belshazzar, who was the Babylonian uh, Empire uh, king, right? So he saw this way before time. And he's speaking. Of course, God is revealing and God is helping him understand it. He's speaking and saying, Medes, Persians, Greeks. Daniel is at that moment serving under Belshazzar, the Babylonian Empire. So he's looking way into time. But then what is interesting is this. Verse 9. Out of one of them came a little horn. So what's the sequence? There's this, this uh, goat representing the Greek Empire. The goat had a big horn, represented Alexander the Great. The horn became very great, meaning the empire grew very quickly. But then the horn was broken. He died. Then in its place came four, not four notable ones. That means his four uh, generals took over. Right. That's verse end of verse eight. And then verse nine. Out of one of them came a little horn. Now this little horn is a very interesting phrase because we've been seeing it in the past. Right in the previous uh, visions he had, um, he we saw it in uh, in Daniel chapter two. He just mentioned um, ten kings, and then another kingdom being established, the kingdom of heaven. Then in Daniel six, uh, he again sees this uh, this little horn, who comes up and he speaks pompous things against God. And he overpowers three of the ten horns. Uh, so that was in Daniel 7. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, then in Daniel 8, we're getting some more information. Where does this little horn come from? So Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, he says, out of one of them, what is one of them? The four territories or kings, kingdoms that were established or governed by the four generals from the Greek Empire. So, this kind of gives us a clue. 
of where the Antichrist is going to come from. Now we don't know precisely or exactly, but we have a gentle idea that the Antichrist is coming from one of these four kingdoms or regions that came out of the Greek Empire, which was governed by the four generals of Alexander the Great. Because he says very clearly, and out of one of them came a little horn. And what did this little, uh, so the question is, when did this little horn come? Now, uh, uh, okay, let's kind of just read uh, a, a few more scriptures. You know, I'm just look at this from verse 9 to verse 14. Okay, Daniel 8, 9 to 14. So what happened? He says, out of one of them came a little horn. Uh, and he tells us about this little horn. Uh, he became exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. That means this little horn was extending its influence in all of these directions. Specifically, he also mentions towards the glorious land, the land of Israel. Verse 10, and it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts or some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. That means um, he is gaining so much an influence that he is beginning to influence those in authority uh, and uh, those you know, those who were in great places of influence. And verse 11, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. That means he's now boasting this, this little horn is boasting not only a over, gaining influence not only on the earth, but is also speaking against spiritual powers. He's gaining influence. So he's you know the stars and the prince of the host, and he's speaking against the Lord Himself. Okay, this little horn. And verse eleven, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away. And the place of a sanctuary was cast down. So now he's talking about daily sacrifices. And the place of a sanctuary, that is the temple. So he's saying this little horn is going to stop sacrifices, daily sacrifices. He's going to desecrate or damage the place of a sanctuary. That's the temple. Okay, let's read on. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn. That means the, he had military power. He had, he had military strength. To oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth down to the ground. That means there's no respect for law, order, justice. No. He did all this and prospered. All right. So the question is, when does this little horn come into play. Now, historically, and I've put this also in the notes, um, uh, his, in the PDF, historically, there was uh, a king called, uh, I'm looking at here in the notes, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. Right? Uh, he, and, and, and it's, it's in, the, in the timeline, he came, um, uh, and, and, and you, can, you can find his name in the historical timeline of uh, Israel, or the Jewish people. So he, he came, this was after Daniel's time. He came and he actually desecrated the temple. right? But, and so some people think, oh, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, this was around 171 to 164 BC. Uh, oh, he fulfilled these scriptures. But, the timing of the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 8, verse 9 to 12 is given in the same chapter. What is the timing? So you go down to verse 23. Right? What do we see there? He says, and in the latter time, so the timing for verse 9 is in the latter time. Right? In the latter time of their kingdom, when transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise. So that's the little horn that 
he's speaking about, uh, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He will destroy fearfully. He will prosper and thrive. He will destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he will cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart and shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, that is the Lord Jesus. But he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told, is true. Seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Okay, so verse 23 gives us the clue for when verse 9 is going to be fulfilled. He says very clearly, in the latter times. So it, it, it didn't have an immediate fulfillment. Right? It wasn't a near fulfillment. It was, he was speaking of, verse 9 is speaking of something way out in the future. Because he's saying, you know, this man who is going to do all these you know, terrible things. He was going to himself speak against the prince of the host. Uh, he uses the phrase prince of the host in verse 11, and he uses the phrase prince of princes in verse 25. So he says, this man is going to speak against the prince of the princes. When is, his, when is he going to come, verse 23, in the latter time? So this is why, you know, we... Uh, we don't say, well, I mean, we, re we recognize that the Jews have always been persecuted and attacked and, uh, you know, uh, evil, was, evil, has, evil has been done against them, the Jewish people. But we don't look back historically and say, hey, that king, you know, whether it was Epiphanes or whether it was some other leader who ill-treated the Jews in terribly, we don't point to them and say, that's the fulfillment. We say, look, he says here in verse 23, it's going to be in the latter time, so it's still way out in the future. It's, it's going to happen. Okay. Then what is this, this little horn going to do? Verse 13. He says here, uh, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation and giving the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. So he's seeing two, two angelic beings talking, having conversation. They're saying, you know, hey, when is this going to happen? Right? Then he hears them talking, and it's intentionally for Daniel to understand. For 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 two thousand three hundred days then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. That means he's saying, hey, there's a period of time, 2,300 days, the, the sacrifices will be, you know, this, this whole thing about the sacrifices being stopped and the temple being desecrated. It's going to happen. So he's not saying literally when it's going to happen. He's going to he's saying basically how long it's going to happen. For two thousand three hundred days, the sacrifices will be stopped, and the temple will be desecrated. That is, uh, the sanctuary will be cast down. Now, he explains this later on. If you look at verse twenty six. He says, and the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told, is true. If you look back at verse 14, in many of our Bibles, the word days will have a little mark and say 2,300 evenings and mornings. So he's talking not not days as in, you know, calendar days as we understand it, but he's talking about evenings and mornings. So um, the, the Jewish day started in the evening, 6 p.m., and went through the other day, the next day, right, 6 to 6 p.m. 
So he says evenings and mornings. So you'll have 2,300 evenings and mornings. And uh, one of the ways that you look at it is, okay, if there are 2,300 evenings and mornings, uh, you divide it by two so that you get about 1,150 calendar days. Uh, one, you know, uh, if, if you're counting 2,300 evenings and mornings, uh, of an evening and a morning put together makes up one day. So you, you divide it by two, you'll get 1,150 days. Uh, now remember, there's a slight difference between the Jewish calendar and the Gregorian calendar, which we are used to. Uh, there's a 10-day difference, approximately, in every year. So the Jewish calendar has 353 to 355 days in the year. The calendar that, that we are used to is about 363 to 365 days, generally, in a year. So there's a 10-day difference. So we, we're not saying precisely, you know, in our terms, this is what's going to be. But it roughly works out to about three and a half Three and a half years, slightly less than three and a half years. Three and a half years in our calculation, Gregorian calculation is 1,277 days. Now, this one is 1,150 days. So you're, you're short by about um, 127 days or something like that. The diff difference. But basically, it's talking about a period of three and a half years three and a half years, when the daily sacrifices will be stopped, the sanctuary will be cast down, and the there is the transgression of desolation, meaning the, this, this man is committing the sin of bringing desolation to the temple and what's happening there. Okay, so... The, the last thing I want to point out here, and then we will take questions, is when, this is verse 17, when Gabriel begins to explain it, he says, verse 17, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. That means there is content in this vision that he's showing you, which is referring to the time of the end. So there are two things here. Verse 17, and again in verse 23, that that kind of that positions things that are happening in this vision for the very end. There are things that happened in the near fulfillment, which is represented by the ram and the goat, the Medes, the Persians, and the Greeks. But then there is also things that are given in this vision, which happens in the time of the end, or in the latter time, which is in the last days, to be fulfilled. So, part of the vision that Daniel saw has already been fulfilled. The ram and the goats, that part is already fulfilled. Part of what he saw is yet to be fulfilled. That little horn that came out of the, one of those four regions, and you know, stop the trans, uh, uh, the offering, the daily offerings, and daily sacrifices, and desecrated the sanctuary, and cast it down, and spoke things against the prince of princes, and all of that. That's yet to be fulfilled because he says it's for the time of the end. It's for the latter time. Okay. So, did we all understand? Chapter 8. Any questions? Everyone's okay? The questions? All right. Okay. 
Asha and Mangi. Please go ahead, Asha, and then Mangi can ask his question as well. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I just had a question where it says that um, in uh, chapter 8, verse 17, so he came near where I stood, and he came and was frightened for my face. But he said to me, Understand, I said to him that the vision is for the time of the end. So is this about the time where where we won't be there, like about the in the book, like close to the book of Revelation, how it describes about the everything that is like. So this is a preparation for the end time, and not now where he's talking mm -hmm. about it. So I'm just kind of confused in this passage. So mm -hmm. can you explain it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so remember. Um, so this little so this little horn is speaking about the Antichrist. So to answer your question, when the Antichrist comes in to visibility, right, makes himself known, we won't be here. So Revelation chapter six verse one and two, that's when the Antichrist comes into visibility. We have been taken out of the way. The church has been taken out of the way. Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we are in heaven. Or you could read it in also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where when he who restrains is taken out of the way, then the man of perdition will be revealed. That is the Antichrist. So when the Antichrist is revealed, or the Antichrist will be revealed only after we are taken out of the way. The church is taken out of the way. So, to answer your question, we won't be here when the little horn is doing all these things, right? Now, he's got seven years to do everything. The little horn, that's the Antichrist. The first, so initially he comes as a man of peace. Yes, he puts in a peace treaty. So the initial part of what he's doing, like he says, he's gaining, uh, he is, verse 9, he's going, growing great towards the south, towards the east, towards a glorious land. I mean, it, so his influence is increasing. Uh, uh, we won't be around, but uh, he is coming forth like a man of peace. But then, in the middle of, somewhere in the middle, right, at, towards the end of the first three and a half years, this is Revelation 11. We will, we will look at it. He breaks his peace treaty. And that's when he does all these things that Daniel spoke about. That means he starts blaspheming against the prince of the princes. He starts speaking evil against ev everyone. He, through his use of military power, this is in verse 12, he stops the sacrifices in the temple and he casts truth to the ground. That means there is no regard for justice and law and he just becomes very powerful. Okay? Um, yes, Master. Yes, Master. Uh, the reason that at home we're talking during our devotion time, they're talking about uh, Satan. So I was just wondering about the Antichrist. Like, uh, he can come, does he come in form, or like he just, because suddenly he comes, it doesn't matter what type of gender or anything, but uh, our perspective view, like my side, that in case they uh, what is this? That, we know that Jesus is a man, and so I don't think he'll have any kind of danger, like, or really come, because I'm not sure, because sometimes he said, yeah, and then plus one more thing is that uh, during the, like, once in the book of uh, Matthew or Mark, I'm not sure, in one of the Gospels, uh, he said, blessed are those who have not seen me yet believes. So for those who are still, like, uh, you said, that we won't be there, right, Pastor, for the thing? Mm, the church will be taken out of the way, but there will be people who become believers after that. Okay. 
yeah so there will be believers on the earth during the tribulation right uh, the church being taken out of the way uh, will cause a lot of people to be saved right they will see this and they will say hey these guys were telling us about this all along and uh, it has happened you know it, it is such a sign and a wonder globally you can imagine you know there will be an aftershock for, for that 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 shakes the world literally you know they say hey, all these christians all these believers have gone disappeared everything's gone you know uh, everything meaning i mean the people have been so it's going to shock the people who are left behind many of them will become believers you know and uh, so there will be believers to answer your question which is uh, who is the antichrist okay so it, it, the in in the text in scripture it always refers to him as a man right he speaks right he 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 so you know, it's almost certain that this antichrist is a man now uh in what what is he he's a man who's empowered by the dragon that means he's empowered by satan right we will see and you read revelation 13 that there is this antichrist and then there is also a false prophet a spiritual leader both are empowered by and the devil but the, they are the two representatives of the devil on the earth who are very powerful during these seven years. So there is the Antichrist. There will also be a false prophet, or the Bible calls him the second beast. Sometimes the, the Bible calls the Antichrist as the, the beast and calls the false prophet as the second beast. But both are empowered by Satan. So they are human beings, the Antichrist and the false prophet are human beings, but they're empowered by spiritually by the devil. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Maggie, your question, please. Thank you, sir. Um, we see, in, I think, in Daniel 8, he says that uh, we say that the Jews will be, will start sacrifice again in the temple. Mm -hmm. um, our question is, uh, Jesus uh, made sacrifice once for all, and mm -hmm. we don't need sacrifice anymore. Mm. And here, and in the Revelation, we see just we, we, we see that God allowed you to to sacrifice to sacrifice animals, and it's it seems like He accepted. And in the old time, in the Old Testament, uh, Jews sacrificed animals and other cultures and uh other people sacrificed animal animals to to god like uh moses's father law for example sacrificed uh uh a, a god to, to the lord so my question pastor is even now is it wrong for those who sacrifice animals to god to continue sacrificing animal animals to god because uh God allows Jews to do it in 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 the in the future temple, and if us who believe we say we want to give God burnt offering, can we do it? Can we burn it and say, God, we are sacrificing this animal to you? Uh, just that more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, interesting question, and my response would be. It depends on which covenant we are operating under. So remember right now, there is a covenant that God had, God established with the Jewish people, starting from Abraham on, reinforced through the, the Mosaic covenant, reaffirmed through his promises to David, that covenant is in force for them, the Jewish people. But then God has established a second covenant 
which we know is the new covenant, which we as people who have faith in Jesus Christ are in. So we who believe in Jesus, we are in the new covenant. And God is calling the Jews to believe in his son Jesus Christ and come under the new covenant. And in the new covenant, there is no more sacrifice for sins. But we know there are Jews who still read the law of Moses. They read the scriptures, Genesis to Malachi. And they are, you know, did God hear the people under the old covenant? Of course, he heard them. Who do they worship? They worshiped Yahweh God. Right? The same God that we worship, the God of the Bible. But they were under the old covenant. So today, there are Jews who are under the old, they're still operating under, we call it so Judaism. Today is known as Judaism, right? They're still operating under Judaism. Now, of course, there will be people who are just doing it as a, you know, as a part of their social life or by tradition. But then there are those who are really seeking God. They read the scriptures and they're seeking Yahweh God. So for them, that covenant is still in force, right? For them, not for us. For us, we are in a new covenant. Has God, you know, has God suddenly said, okay, I won't work any longer with the Jewish people? No, no, no. He's still working, and and and, and you, know, you, you you will be you probably learned. I forget when you did the book of Romans last semester or this semester, but uh, uh, you read about it in Romans chapters 9, 10, 11, where Paul just beautifully explains how right now God is working among the Gentiles to bring us all together so that when the time of the Gentiles is over, then he brings us all together. But he has not given up on the Jewish people. And whatever he promised Abraham is still in force, and he still cares for them. So will God hear their prayer? Of course he will. But he's going to be pointing to Jesus Christ. And he say, hey, I've moved on and I've, I've established this new covenant. I need you to come into the new covenant. So that's why, you know, as Paul writes in Ephesians 2, he's bringing both, one, making them one, you know, Jew and Gentile, through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So. The question that you're asking is, you know, the, the, the sacrifices that these people are offering and will be offering, not only here in this third temple, which we call it the tribulation temple, but in the millennial temple, right? So Ezekiel refers to the millennial temple, which is in uh, chapters 40 to 48. Uh, that means for a thousand years, sacrifices are going to be offered in the millennial temple. While Christ himself is seated in Jerusalem and everybody are worshipping Jesus, there's the millennial temple and sacrifice are being offered there. Um, now for whatever reason, and, you know, we can, it's not given to us in scripture why God has instituted that. But we can just say that it's, it will be probably a constant reminder to them that all of these things they are doing is fulfilled in the person of Christ. Maybe. That's just something we can think of, right? But it's not given, not written to us. But Ezekiel 42, 48 clearly tells us there's going to be a millennial temple where sacrifices are being offered. The question is, will those sacrifices be accepted by God? And uh, my thought is, because it's... Put on, it is under the old covenant, and God instituted the old covenant. Yes, He's going to look at that and He's going to accept it, but He's pointing, He's always calling them to faith in Jesus Christ. You come to faith in Christ, you come to this Jesus who is a fulfillment of everything, and in Jesus, you don't need uh, the sacrifices anymore. I hope I answered your question, Maggie. Yes, sir. you did. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Christopher, see your hand, please.
Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, my question is about um, you know the current times where um, uh, you know there is a lot of infighting right now happening in uh, in Israel, and um, you know with with the Palestine um, with the with the Palestinians, and uh, right now the um, major threat that is that is coming or the the country that is of you know the that is the major threat to Israel is uh, Iran, and um, this is so, so, you know country that possibly could uh, also uh, uh, you know get uh, nuclear uh, arms and you know uh, mm. therefore be a force to 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 destroy Israel as well as a lot of the other countries. So is there any any, uh, any sort of uh, reference to that um, in Daniel or Revelations with regards to uh, the uh, the fighting that is happening and it's been for many years now with you know with the Palestinians and uh, Israel is slowly getting getting larger and you know they seem to be taking more and more of the land but again the, the threat is actually coming from Iran mm. uh, or the biggest threat is Iran uh, for mm. them mm. so I just wanted to get uh, to understand if there's any any sort of reference to that yeah um so the answer is yes and we'll look at ezekiel chapter 38 um verses 1 through 5. um so ezekiel 38 and 39 um, refer to the final battle of armageddon and how it builds up so it is referenced in the book of Revelation, uh, both in Revelation, I think it's um, uh, Revelation 16 and then in Revelation 19, right? So uh, when when he talks about the armies from the east coming in and and, and uh, you know, then the build up towards the battle of Armageddon. But to answer your question specifically, in Ezekiel 38, uh, you look at the different tribes and nations being mentioned. So he says in verse 2, he says, Set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and again, I'm not a, you know, I, I don't, I'm just going by the, the, the research that others have done. Uh, and, and, and you will read that Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal are referring to tribes that are actually part of Russia modern day Russia. So he's speaking, he says, look, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And he says in verse 3, I'm against you, O Gog. So Gog referring to the leaders from this region, Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And um, he says, I will put a hook in your jaws and, and, and so on. And then if you read the whole chapter, it, it kind of unfolds what they're going to do. But in verse 5, he specifically mentions Persia. Persia in the Bible refers to Iran, right? Persia in Bible times, old times, is modern day Iran. So verse 5, Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya. So what's going to happen? There's coming a time when Russians will invade Israel from the north. And he describes, you know, um, uh, uh, what, what will happen. Uh, it says um, that these people, you know, uh, uh, let me point to you, point you to, um, he says, the evil thought will come into your heart when you will, yeah. Uh, uh, verse 16, he says, you know, uh, Ezekiel 38, 16, you will come up against my people Israel like a club to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I'm hallowed in you, O Gog, before the eyes. Gog, referring to the, the Russian, you know, we would interpret it as the Russians because it refers to the leaders of uh, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, tribes of Russia. They're coming against Israel. But whom are they supported by? They are supported by Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, meaning Persia is Iran. So. 
and you can see this happening the way Iran you know probably they already have nuclear weapons they are in alliance with Russia so you would have read in the news earlier I mean in, in the last recent months when some of the drone attacks that Russia was conducting against Ukraine those armaments were supplied by Iran right so we so there is that understanding uh, Iran Russia China they're not necessarily like great friends but they're aligned with each other right uh, and they kind of you know in a quiet way helping each other so to answer your question yes Thank you. Yeah. Um, Abhishek's question. Is the false prophet from Catholic Church because the Pope has unified all religions of the world? Is the false prophet from the Catholic Church? Now, um, when, when we read about the false prophet, Revelation chapter 13 and then later on we read again in Revelation 17 we read about the false prophet these are the two chapters that talk to us about the false prophet in which we will look at when we when we start going through the book of Revelation um, obviously the Bible doesn't tell us or doesn't give us any indication um, that the false prophet belongs to you know would be the Catholic Church or any of that it doesn't give us so um, there are a lot of people through the through the years um, who've speculated and tried to point to, you know uh, the false prophet coming from the Catholic Church my answer is we don't know for sure right um, we just know that he's a religious leader who's got great influence and we'll read about it in chapters 13 and 17 and about his influence and so on but the key thing is he's going to support the Antichrist and he's going to be hand in hand in hand with the Antichrist so would the Roman Catholic Church do such a thing I don't I don't I don't know I don't know and so I, I think it's better not to say such something like this because it's going to unnecessarily cause ill will you know between people you know when we especially when we're not sure about something right so better not to speculate like this and just say that yeah it is a world religious leader but we don't know exactly who it could be yeah that that would be my response so we'll take a break now uh, thank you for your questions I want to just come back to chapter 8, quickly review it, and over the break time, if you have any further questions, please come back after the break and ask them. And then we'll quickly review chapter 8, then move into chapter 9. Okay? Thank you. See you in, see in about 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 